What's going on everybody? Jason here from The Comprehensive Dentist and today we're going to talk dental caries or what patients like to call cavities, right? So what we're going to do is, is we're going to have a little bit of an overview of caries. We're going to talk about what essential things every patient needs to actually develop caries because it is a disease process, right? And we're going to talk about what influencing factors can actually contribute to making that disease process happen or making it worse in some situations. We're also going to discuss types of caries because in case you didn't know, there are different types of dental caries disease processes or presentations that you can see in the mouth. Being able to diagnose caries is a huge deal. As a dentist, that's one of the few things that you need to know solid. You need to be able to diagnose caries without any issues and you should know what kind of options are available to you. Part of being a good operative or restorative dentist is understanding how to manage the caries disease process. We're going to talk about CAMBRA or Caries Management by Risk Assessment. Being able to do a caries risk assessment for your patient and then turn that into actual treatment. The last thing we're going to discuss is the Anderson Medical Model. Now this is just one model that you can use to actually treat your patients that have dental caries but it's a good model. It's actually got a lot of longevity to it and it's got a lot of good points that you can take back to your practice and be able to implement these things immediately. Now, if you're watching this on the website, make sure you download the handout because it's gonna have the actual presentation slides that you can print out and you can follow along with this presentation so you know exactly what we're talking about. So what is dental caries, right? That's one question that you're gonna commonly get from your patients. They're gonna ask you, what causes this? Why do I have this issue? Now, at the simplest level, essentially what's happening is the patient is losing minerals from the teeth what we like to call demineralization. Now, bacteria in the mouth actually metabolize carbohydrates and in turn, they produce acid as a byproduct. When acid is produced, now you have a situation where the environment in the mouth is not very conducive of retaining minerals in the teeth. Acid actually lowers the tooth's ability to be able to hold those minerals in place. It lowers that pH. Now there's critical pHs for certain types of tooth structure that you should know. For enamel, the pH that is critical is 5.5. When the mouth gets to a pH level of 5.5, then the tooth actually starts to lose minerals from the enamel structure. Now, if dentin is exposed for whatever reason, the pH for that that's a little bit more critical is 6.2. Dentin cannot tolerate very acidic conditions as well as enamel. So at the pH 6.2, dentin's gonna actually start to lose minerals from its structure. When the pH drops, the tooth starts to lose calcium and it loses phosphate minerals from the tooth structure. As those minerals are lost, we call this process demineralization. Now, when enough tooth structure or enough minerals is lost, now you start to have a cavitation of that physical tooth structure leading to a cavity or what we call dental caries. Now keep in mind, Dental caries is not just a process of demineralization. We actually have a combination of demineralization occurring where tooth is losing minerals and the tooth is trying to gain minerals or what we call remineralization. So this dynamic process is constantly occurring and it's occurring at a rate over a period of time. And if one of these things is in an excess or it happens more often than the other, then you get a tipping of the scale and you either have a tooth that stays solid, or you have a tooth that develops caries. So for every patient that gets a cavity, you have to have four big things or four things present to actually have that cavity process to occur. Now first, you need a susceptible host. Obviously, if somebody's getting a cavity, they are a susceptible host. They're capable of getting the caries process. The next thing you need is cariogenic bacteria or a cariogenic biofilm. So specific types of bacteria in the mouth that produce lactic acid as a byproduct. The third thing you need is a food source for that bacteria. That bacteria has to feed off of something and once it's fed off that food source, it actually produces that acid as a byproduct. And the last thing you need for the caries process is time. This takes time to occur. 
Patients do not get cavities or the caries process overnight. It actually occurs over a period of months or years in some situations. It's like I was talking about earlier. There's a dynamic scale there. So you have to be able to understand that there's a process of demineralization and remineralization occurring at the same time. So I said you need four big things for caries to occur. Now keep in mind that you have to have these four things, but there's multiple other things that actually influence these four things, right? There's things that influence on a primary level that happen on almost a daily basis that actually occur and affect the environment in the mouth. And there's also things that influence that caries disease process that are actually external or not really related to what's going on in the mouth, but they're external influencing factors. So what are some of the primary factors that you need to think about? Well, obviously we mentioned there's different types of bacteria in the mouth. There's a lot of different types of bacteria and some of those produce more acid as a byproduct than others. The other thing is the patient's diet, right? We think a lot about, oh, well cavities is because patients eat a lot of candy, right? That's what patients typically think. Oh, is if I eat a lot of candy or I drink a lot of Mountain Dew, then I'm gonna get the caries process. But no, it's more than that, right? The diet is very dynamic. It's very big. It's very influential. People eat a lot of different stuff. And you can have people that do not eat candy, that do not drink soda, that will get caries. Oral hygiene is a huge, huge factor here, right? Patients never seem to think because they have this stuff all over their teeth that they never brush off, that that doesn't have anything to do with the caries process. How many times have you had a patient actually say to you, oh, I have soft teeth, or oh, this is a problem because it runs in my family, right? Never mind the fact that their teeth have never seen a toothbrush. That is a huge, huge factor that influences a patient's ability to get caries. Now, patients love to talk about genetics, and granted, genetics are important. However, genetics only impact how the teeth develop. Once the teeth are developed, now you have a crystalline mineralized structure that really has no influence from genetics at that point. It's not like there's cell turnover on the outside of the tooth on a regular basis like you would expect on the surface of your skin. That's just not going to happen. So genetics only affects the development and really after that, it's not a very big player in the overall caries process. So tooth anatomy is another big thing. Think about all the different anatomy presentations that you see in your patients on a regular basis. Some people have very unique anatomy that just really is conducive to a cavity starting in those areas. Or think about your patients that have malocclusion, right? They need braces because they have so much overlap. They have a lot of teeth that are kind of crooked and rotated. In those situations, it's extremely difficult for patients to be able to get in there and clean those areas well and keep the plaque off the teeth. Fluoride exposure and the ability to have antimicrobials as a part of the normal oral hygiene regimen is an influencing factor. If patients using fluoride toothpaste, that's actually helping to tip that scale towards remineralization. If a patient's using an antimicrobial, it's helping to lower that bacteria count, that specific cariogenic bacteria count that helps lead to the caries process. We wanna eliminate that bacteria, we wanna lower that count. Salivary flow, the ability to produce saliva like I'm doing right now, talking, that is a huge factor that plays into a patient's ability to develop caries. If you have a lot of saliva, it actually does a lot of things, and we're going to talk about that. But it's very important that a patient has adequate amount of saliva so that they can actually use that to their benefit to help prevent dental caries. Now, when I talk about secondary factors or external influencing factors, there's a lot of different things we could talk about here. Now, I'm not gonna go into any specifics here because if you pick up a dental journal that talks about the caries process, that talks about you know, doing these studies in certain populations, or they go out in like rural areas and they look at oh, which uh, you know, socioeconomic groups actually get caries, that's kind of what the secondary external factors relate to, right? It's all about like socioeconomic status. What's the education level of the patient? What's the age of the patient? You know, what's the um, lifestyle like for that patient? Is it more prevalent in certain ethnic groups, certain occupations, that sort of thing. Those kind of things relate to secondary influencing factors on that caries process. 
Now I do have a picture in the slides of a graph that shows the four main things you need for carries in the center of a circle. And then around that tiny circle is another circle that encompasses that. It's the primary influencing factors. And then around that one is the secondary influencing factors. So it really kind of puts it in a perspective that you can see and understand how all these things intertwine. It is complex. It is very hard to say for sure what causes a patient to have caries. It's multifactorial. So when a patient comes in, you can't just say, oh, you got a cavity because you don't brush your teeth. Oh, you got a cavity because you drink too much Mountain Dew or you eat too much candy. It's not just that, right? There's a lot of things that impact that and you have to be able to identify what things cause the caries process in your specific patient. That's what we're gonna talk about later when we talk about caries risk assessment. Now, it's like I mentioned earlier. On one hand, we have demineralization occurring, loss of minerals, loss of tooth structure. On the other hand, we have remineralization occurring where we're trying to put more minerals in the tooth. We're trying to strengthen that tooth. And every day, depending on what a patient encounters, what they do, it either tips that scale one way or the other. So you have what's called protective factors that kind of basically lean more towards remineralization, or you have pathologic factors that cause the scale to tip more towards developing a cavity.